The term capsule computers may not mean much to you, but it led to one of gaming's most enduring and beloved developers. That's the term from which Capcom took its name in 1979, after all, and it's what the company called its earliest arcade machines. And we don't mean video games, we mean prize machines such as this one, many of which have been all but lost to history. It wasn't until 1983 that the company actually started developing video games, debuting with Volgus. It wasn't half bad, and its visuals were be out of place in a throwback indie shooter today, but it gave little indication of just how many of the industry's biggest franchises the company would introduce to the world. Today we're taking a look at every last one of those franchises and ranking them from worst to best. The rules are simple, which is good because you won't pay attention to them anyway. We are calculating the overall critical reception of each game in each of Capcom's franchises to determine, with absolutely no room for argument, the exact mathematical ranking of each in terms of quality. We are only counting franchises that have three or more games, and we are not taking later remakes, remasters, or collections into account. We are also not counting spin-offs. Pretty clear, right? Not clear at all, no. Capcom has a habit of remaking its games in such a way that it's not always obvious whether or not the remake should be considered the same game as the original, or a different game with the same premise. Nor is it clear about what's a spin-off and what's simply an experimental release within a series. Additionally, Capcom loves releasing its games across several platforms in quick succession, making it less clear what qualifies as a port. We've done our best to untangle these things, but you may see something on this list that you don't agree with, and that's okay. Because you didn't make this list, and it's nothing to get upset over, I promise. We won't be counting original arcade releases due to a lack of contemporary reviews to consult, but we will be counting their first home ports. And finally, the standard exclusions in the form of licensed sports games, LCD games, mobile games, and anything else that deserves universal hate and derision. Let's rank them. I'm Ben, and I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is every Capcom franchise ranked from worst to best. Number 35. Gun Survivor, 54.8%. The series that was only really a series in Japan, Gun Survivor came to the West stripped of that banner. We're counting it anyway, mainly because something has to be at the bottom of this list and it might as well be something nobody likes. Three Gun Survivor games are Resident Evil spin-offs, and there was also a single Dino Crisis themed entry called Dino Stalker. Review scores were atrocious, somewhere below the approval rating of the Black Death. On the bright side, the averages did increase with every game. On the less bright side, the highest scoring game barely cracked. 66%. They're basically light gun shooters, though they are playable with standard controllers. Only playable with standard controllers in some cases, as light gun support was removed from the first game in North America. Resident Evil and Dino Crisis fans enjoyed the tension of those series, with their scarce resources and emphasis on puzzle solving. Gun Survivor took away those things, replacing them with more monsters to shoot. I think I may have found the problem. Either series can work as a light gun experience. The Chronicles games for the Wii were good, and Jurassic Park's arcade shooters make it rather clear that blasting terrible thunder lizards is great fun. It's not that Gun Survivor couldn't work, but rather it didn't work, and that's what makes it all the more frustrating. Number 34. Mega Man Star Force, 57.61%. The seventh and so far final full series in the overall Mega Man franchise, Mega Man Star Force attempted to capture the magic of Mega Man Battle Network while also making it accessible to newcomers. Was it successful? Would you be hearing about it already if it were? The series made no secret about patterning its releases after Pokemon. The first game came in Pegasus, Leo, and Dragon versions, with each one having exclusive content, meaning that at least one person bought three different versions of a game they didn't like. It earned an embarrassing series high of just 59.33%. The second game came in two versions, Zerka X Ninja and Zerka X Saurian. 
which meant something to somebody. It's the best-selling game in the series and the lowest scoring, averaging only 55%. Fans and critics alike agreed that Star Force felt like Battle Network with all the charm and nostalgia stripped out. The wireless multiplayer available on the DS was nice, but evidently not nice enough for many critics to recommend it. The third game was also available in two versions, Red Joker and Black Ace. It earned 58.5% and Capcom quietly cancelled the series. Both fans were heartbroken. Number 33. Commando, 63.22%. As an arcade game, Commando had its merits. It popularized the run-and-gun genre, and it didn't look bad for 1985. Commando was the story of Super Joe, and you just know he gave himself that nickname. He's on a mission to shoot basically anyone, really. He's not picky. It was among the top-grossing arcade games in Japan, the UK, and the USA, which meant only one thing appalling home ports. The best known of these is the NES port, and when it comes to being disappointing, it does not disappoint. It's not great, but it earned an average of 62.4%, which was still better than the Mega Drive version of its sequel, Mercs, at 61.25%. Mercs is the better game in reality, if only because it doesn't play like your console is trying to pass a bowel obstruction. The series high goes to Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3, released in 2008. With such a long gap between releases, you might expect Commando 3 to... Actually, never mind. Whatever you might expect Commando 3 to do, it doesn't do it. Critics awarded it 66%, citing simplistic gameplay, dull levels, and character design that seems like the developers played their first game on new grounds and thought, this is the future. Only time will tell if we'll get another title, and which horse of the apocalypse it will ride in. Number 32. Steel Battalion. 63.67%. Sometimes Capcom's risks perform exceptionally well. Sometimes they crash and burn. In the case of Steel Battalion, they do one and then the other. The first game was an expensive gamble, requiring players to use a massive 44 input controller consisting of buttons, sticks, dials, and pedals. This was in 2002, by the way, before Guitar Hero made clunky peripheral you'd never use again a selling point. Well, that's not entirely true. You could use it one more time with the second game, Line of Contact. You controlled an enormous mech that was as powerful and as complicated as it looked. If you wanted to wield the power of your towering kill bot, though, you had to learn what everything on that control panel did and how to use it. The first game scored 83%, and the second scored 70%, which means that the average of 63.67% must have come down to one real plop of a third game, right? Right indeed, as Heavy Armor was a Kinect exclusive. After all, when it comes to games requiring complexity and precision, the best peripheral is one that does not work. Critics saddled it with 38% and made Capcom sign a blood oath that they would never do it again. So far, at least, they've honored the agreement. Number 31. SNK vs Capcom Card Fighters 64.5% this isn't the first attempt we've seen on this list to siphon funds away from Pokemon fans, but it's probably the most blatant. Card Fighters was a collaboration with SNK, with Capcom contributing their characters and imagery to the digital card game, but little else. Since there's no guarantee we'll get around to every SNK franchise ranked, however, we're putting it here. The first game was released for the Neo Geo Pocket Color in two versions, SNK version and Capcom version. The main difference between them, Pokemon style baby, was the fact that each had exclusive cards that could be traded by linking with someone who had the other version. The game averaged 74.9% because if you hit yourself over the head hard enough, you could pretend you were playing Pokemon. The second game added more cards and card types, but earned an average of 70.6%. For the third game, SVC Cardfighters DS, SNK decided to try releasing it on a system that people actually owned. This backfired because it exposed the series to more people who hated it, and it averaged only 48%. Also, it included a a game-breaking bug that we managed to avoid by never playing the game in the first place. This resulted in a costly cartridge replacement program for SNK. We're sure that didn't kill the series on its own, but it certainly didn't help. Number 30. Breath of Fire 66.98% Released in 1993, Breath of Fire looked and sounded excellent, which is to say that it was a 16-bit game by Capcom. Its genre was a bit less expected, though. Turn-based RPGs were not the company's forte. And to be honest, it shows. The story is weak and the combat is dull, but it's a decent first step. When the game came west, Capcom teamed up with Squaresoft, working with team members who localized all-time greats The Secret of Mana and Final Fantasy VI. From there, the series 
series found its footing. The sequel refined and expanded upon the original, and the third game moved to the far more powerful PlayStation. The story didn't get much deeper, you were still a dragon man in fairly typical RPG combat, but the environments and characters gained much more personality. The fifth game implemented sweeping changes that reviewers predicted would fail to satisfy fans, but it earned a respectable 78% and seemed to represent a new twist on the formula. This was in 2002, though, and fans didn't get another game until 2016. What did the fans get for their patience? Well, it's probably best if I just read from the Capcom database on this one. Breath of Fire 6 was a free-to-play, online, web-based, multiplayer, role-playing video game with microtransactions. It was what precisely nobody wanted, and it was received with all the enthusiasm of a burst testicle. It scored a scathing 20.8% and was shuttered the following year. Number 29. Strider. 67.19%. The arcade game Strider is... Right, listen, I don't have any clue what Strider is, even after playing it. It's some kind of futuristic sci-fi beat-em-up. Although he has a sword, and he's fighting robots in Russia, and... I can try to make sense of this, but we'll be here all day. Strider is a game about Flash, and it's got Flash to spare, with every attack landing like a neutron bomb. The Mega Drive got a faithful port, but that wasn't the first home console Strider game. The NES had that honour, but it was a different game entirely. It's also the second worst regarded game in the series. The worst regarded, you ask? Why, that would be Strider 2. Released by US Goal, the company that would have ruined fewer childhoods if it simply went door to door murdering parents. It scored 49.17%. In the year 2000, ten years later, Capcom released another game called Strider 2 and decreed that no one would ever mention the previous one again under penalty of torture. It scored 69%, which we can all agree is very nice. In 2014, we got the final game in the series, a reboot that was also called Strider, with the best score overall, 75.4%. It also leaves a mess of names for future historians to puzzle over, as there are three distinct games called Strider, and two distinct games called Strider 2. Hopefully, if Strider ever returns, it will be with Strider 8, just to keep us on our toes. Number 28. Final Fight. 67.39%. What does your mayor do when the city is in trouble? If the answer is anything other than strip to the waist and start snapping the spines of street toughs, you may want to consider moving to wherever Mayor Mike Hager is in charge. That's one civic leader who isn't held back by red tape. In fact, I think he uses it to strangle people, actually. Final Fight was among the best arcade ports of its era, bringing the gorgeous visuals, banging soundtrack, and crunchy fisticuffs into the home to a miraculously faithful degree. You lost two-player co-op, but on the bright side, you also lost Guy as a playable character, meaning you didn't have to press the D-pad another time to get to Cody or Hagger. I'm assuming it's Hagger. Is it Hagger? Probably. It scored 71.23% on average. The next two sequels were received with similar warmth, and even Mighty Final Fight, a cartoony reimagining for the NES, scored well, owning 76.4%. Final Fight was one more reliable Capcom classic. So what's it doing down here? Well, Final Fight lost its final fight. Streetwise for the PS2 is by far the worst received game in the series, with an abysmal 42.5%, and you're already looking up the price of a used copy to send us for worst games ever, I see you. Critics conceded that Streetwise was playable and wouldn't necessarily give you an incurable disease, but couldn't find much positive to say beyond that. Number 27. 1940X. 68.53%. One of Capcom's earliest arcade hits was 1942, and it was also among the first games that the company released on the NES. Some sources claim it was the very first, but details are surprisingly sketchy. Regardless, the arcade game was huge, giving the then small company a global presence almost overnight, and launching the career of Yoshiki Okamoto. You may not know his name, but you definitely know his games. He'd go on to produce Gunsmoke, Final Fight, and Street Fighter 2, and he even had his hand in Red Dead Revolver, which I am told has led to a decently popular series of its own. The NES version paled in comparison to the arcade original, though, even more so than arcade to NES ports usually did. The controls were stiff, the music was indistinguishable from having your eardrum pierced, and it ran at the frame rate of its own box art. Still, it scored 61.6% on average. Not great, 
but higher than it deserved. Ports of the later games in the series fared much better, with 1941 Counter-Attack reaching 73.6%, a passing grade, but one you'd probably still try to hide from your parents. Scoring slightly worse was 1943 The Battle of Midway, which is not to be confused with Midway's game 3491 The Battle of Capcom. The series went dormant until 2008 when the Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network got a follow-up in the form of 1942 Joint Strike. More like 19420, am I right, my dudes? Am I? Am I right? Am I? It scored 68.5%, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that it was a remake of, you know, 1942. Instead, it took elements from various games in the series and mixed them together into a flavourless broth that most people forgot about before it even finished downloading. But hey, at least the arcade games are still fun. Number 26. Lost Planet. 69%. Nice. Capcom has done a decent job of hooking themselves to the most successful consoles of each generation. When Microsoft made an unexpectedly large splash with its Xbox then, the developers refused to let the 360 pass them by. Capcom came up with Lost Planet Extreme Condition, designed to be a perfect exclusive for Microsoft, which was already developing a reputation as a home to great shooters. Sure enough, it was a commercial success, shifting around 2.8 million units. That does count its eventual ports to other systems though. You know Capcom an exclusive it ends more or less the moment they finish shaking hands. It was a welcome new IP, which could have benefited from having its issues ironed out in a sequel. We got the sequel, but not the ironing. Lost Planet earned an average of 79%, but Lost Planet 2 dropped to 68%. Capcom also released a BlackBerry version of the game, which is something that somebody thought was a good use of the company's resources. The series died with Lost Planet 3. It earned 60% on average, but that's high considering the lack of positive comments reviewers had for it. The digital fix could only find two nice things to say, and one of them was that it is not as bad as Aliens Colonial Marines. I've played Aliens Colonial Marines, and I can say the same thing about getting dental work without anaesthetic. Peter? Number 25. Ghosts and Goblins. 69. Nice. 0.01%. Have you ever wanted to fight evil in your underpants? Of course you have! That's one of the inherent draws of playing video games. Arthur understands the appeal as well. That's what he spends most of every Ghosts and Goblins game doing. That suit of armour might as well be made out of pasta for all the protection it provides. Ghosts and Goblins is known as Makaimura in Japan, which makes a lot more sense. Admittedly, I don't know what it actually means, but they at least use it consistently. Here, the games are usually called Ghosts and Goblins, but other times they're called Ghouls and Ghosts. Also, if the title is meant to imply ghosts and goblins, there should be apostrophes on either side of the N. The way it's written, with just one, it seems more like it's short for Ghosts on Goblins, which suggests a different kind of game entirely. Nearly all of them have the same premise. Arthur takes Princess Prin Prin to a graveyard, where she's whisked away by Satan before she can ask Arthur why he removed his clothes. What follows is a brutal gauntlet of horror, which you must complete twice to see the ending, establishing Capcom itself as the true evil. The similarity of the games has led to largely similar scores, with a few dips into lower territory. The lowest dip came with Makaimura for Wonder Swan, which scored 36.4%, though that feels massively harsh. We can only assume critics were unnerved by the lovingly rendered demon cheeks in the intro. And now you probably are as well. You're welcome. Number 24. Mega Man Battle Network. 72.21%. With the main Mega Man series featuring so many different characters, bosses, and weapons, it might have seemed like a waste to scrap basically all of them for each new game. Enter Mega Man Battle Network, which reinterprets those elements of Mega Man as an RPG, and quite a good one, actually. The first game scored 79%, which is a higher average than eight of the core Mega Man games. Reviewers praised it for its unique spin on a familiar formula, and and its grid-based battle system. It was by no means perfect, though. Exploration in the digital realm was tedious and confusing, for instance, but it was a great start, and it was improved upon for a second game, which earned 81%. That was the peak of the series, though. Perhaps not coincidentally, it was also the last game to be released in only one version. 
From there, the games came in two iterations, with names such as Blue Moon and Red Sun for Battle Network 4, and Psy Beast Falzar and Psy Beast Gregor for Battle Network 6, probably because Capcom really wanted to confuse grandmothers trying to buy Christmas gifts. The series never got truly bad, the lowest rated game is Battle Network 6 with 62.5%, but it did wear out its welcome rather quickly, as the company seemed to prioritise striking while the iron was hot, rather than creating must-play experiences. Number 23, Mega Man X, 72.83%. Mega Man X was released for the SNES in 1993, and though the classic Mega Man series continued to get games, this was where Capcom focused most of their attention. For the first few games at least, that attention paid off. X and X2 were met with acclaim, with the original holding the series high of 88.5%. Not every Mega Man fan was on board with the darker tone, but it was easy to love its solid design, gorgeous sprite work, and the increased focus on exploration and upgrades. Until Mega Man X6, that is. That's when, critically at least, the franchise started to collapse under its own weight. It retained the appearance and gameplay of the excellent X4 and somewhat less excellent X5, but for the first time, the design felt bloated and careless. Critics gave it 65% and a note that said, See me after class in red pen. Oh. Then, X7 smashed through the bottom of the barrel and kept going to the core of the earth, garnering a far too generous 58% along the way. This was the series' attempt to bring itself into 3D, and fans pleaded with it to stop hurting them. We got one final entry with X8, which scored 68%. Notably better, but not enough for Capcom to greenlight any more entries. We can't blame them. We still have nightmares about X7 ourselves. Number 22, Dino Crisis, 73.53%. We've already ranked every Jurassic Park game from worst to best, maybe go watch that after this video, but certainly we can agree that the best Jurassic Park game is Dino Crisis. Lack of license be damned! The game sees you touching down on a remote island to investigate a research facility that has brought dinosaurs back to life through advanced cloning techniques. Oh no, actually it's through a hole in time, apparently. <laughs> That was close. They were one strand of frog DNA away from a meeting with Michael Crichton's lawyers. Survival horror with dinosaurs is a fair way to summarise it, and probably the most compelling summary of anything in history. Although incidentally, the first game was actually marketed as, rather than survival horror, panic horror, which is also a pretty fair summary. It was a commercial success, and critics loved it, awarding it 83.59%. The sequel wasn't as uniformly beloved by fans, though. The deliberate pace and tricky puzzles of the first game were replaced by a far more action-oriented experience. Critics rated it higher, however, with 86%. The overall average in the low 70s is entirely down to Dino Crisis 3, which managed to unite the fanbase. It united them in anger, but you know, still, still unity. The series jumped to the Xbox here, but no Sony fans missed it, and no Microsoft fans wanted anything to do with it. A terrible camera, empty level design, and a general lack of refinement were all the things critics were able to say politely so that they didn't have to slowly walk up to it and declare it to be one big pile of sh- Number 21, Sengoku Basara, 73.8%. Sengoku Basara is a huge series for Capcom, though it doesn't have nearly as large a presence in the West. Hence my pronunciation. <laughs> Japanese fans received not only more of the games, but also anime, manga, a live-action TV show, novels, stage shows, and more. Sengoku Basara takes place in an alternate history version of the Sengoku period of feudal Japan, using real-life warlords and skirmishes as its backbone. 
Being an action-packed retelling of one particular era of Japanese history, therefore, Capcom was not convinced that the rest of the world would be all that interested. The company reworked the first game as Devil Kings, stripping it of its real-world inspirations and packaging it as a work of fantasy instead. While the original game performed well with critics in Japan, Western critics were baffled by it, awarding it only 64%. Perhaps burned by the poor reception, Capcom didn't bother localizing the sequel at all, which is a shame because that one earned 82.6% on average. Instead, they were dedicated to providing Western audiences with the weakest entries, giving them Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes, which earned the series low of 63%. Next came Sengoku Basara 4, which achieved the series high of 85.6%, meaning Capcom was wasn't going to share that one with us either. The company's strategy of only releasing the worst games in the West somehow did not win over the critics. <laughs> Weird that. Number 20. Mega Man, 73.92%. Mega Man was a labor of love by Capcom employees who had a vision but very little official support. They proposed a non-linear experience that could be redefined with every playthrough based on the path a player would take through the game. Visually, it took more than a little inspiration from Astro Boy and Super Sentai, with a bit of comic book supervillain flair. Also, it was tough as nails because the developers wanted the players to hate themselves. It became an unexpected success, though, not least because it felt so little like anything else that was available at the time. After the NES, though, the series faltered a bit, with one game released on the SNES, but two released on the Super Famicom, and one on the PlayStation. It then sunk into a long absence that was only broken by Mega Man 9 in 2008, which reminded everyone why they loved the robot in blue pajamas who slaughtered baddies to funky disco beats. Critically, the series peaked with Mega Man 2, earning 85.2%. It's a pair of PC games bringing up the rear with 49.2% and 54.8%. The lowest rated non-PC title is Rockman and Forte Challenger from the Future for the Wonderswan, with a much more respectable 67.2%. We did think about not counting the PC games, but that felt disingenuous. They are official Capcom products. They were not developed by Capcom, but neither were Mega Man 9 and 10, which are two of the best reviewed games in the series. Ultimately, the only reason not to count the PC games is that they aren't very good, and once we start discounting counting games for being bad, we've kind of demolished the point of these lists entirely. <laughs> Sorry, Mega Man. Number 19. Mega Man World, 74.32%. Western fans might be a bit confused about this one, because the games lost their Mega Man World branding, or Rockman World branding if you want to get Japanese about this, when they were localized. That led many to assume that these were Game Boy ports of the NES games, but they were actually completely different. Each one took elements of two NES games, remixed them, added new bosses and weapons, and built original stages around them. This pattern continued until the fifth and final game, which gave fans a completely new adventure, packed with unique content that stood shoulder to shoulder with those games in terms of quality. In fact, it scored better than all but two of them, which is impressive for the fifth game in an often overlooked handheld series. Mega Man 5, or V if you want to get Roman numerals about this, earned a very well-deserved average of 82.6%. Strangely, the worst performing game is the first first, with 68.4%. I say it strangely not because it's great, but because Mega Man 2 is far worse, playing and sounding like its code is held together by chewing gum and bandages. Still, it performed a bit better, with an undeservedly nice 69%, and we will respect that. We'll complain about it, but yeah, we'll respect it too. Number 18. Cross, 74.33%. In 2005's Japan-only game, Namco Cross Capcom, yeah, it really is pronounced that way, the worlds of those companies collided, and with them, entire histories of gaming. It was fan service of the best kind. Classic Namco characters from the Tales series, Klonoa, Dig Dug, and Xenosaga met up with classic Capcom characters such as 
you know, the guy who held the gun in Resident Evil Dead Aim. Oh. Love that, love that dude. The point is, fans loved it, and it scored an 80% average. But the series wouldn't come westward until its 3DS successor, Project Cross Zone. This time, Sega characters worked their way into the chaos, with emissaries from Valkyria Chronicles, Sakura Wars, and Space Channel 5 pitching in to... Uh, well, actually, nobody's been quite able to make sense of the story to this day. It's genuine nonsense, where they focus instead on a surprisingly engaging combat system and the mere thrill of seeing so many franchises come together. It's the low point of the series, critically, but it still scored a respectable 70%. The third game, Project Cross Zone 2, did a bit better, with 73%, and even convinced Nintendo to loan out a few characters, namely Crom and Lucina, from from Fire Emblem Awakening. Welcome additions, to be sure, but anyone who was hoping to see Frank West and Luigi pairing up to battle the supernatural, or Leon Kennedy swapping hair care tips with Donkey Kong, was bound to be disappointed. Number 17. Street Fighter EX, 74.49%. The Street Fighter series more or less single-handedly established the entire foundation for fighting games, but over time, it lost ground to other series such as Virtua Fighter and Tekken. In those games, 3D models had a lot to do with their appeal, but Street Fighter's developers weren't confident enough to take the series into the third dimension just yet. They decided instead to test the waters with a spin-off series, Street Fighter EX, and they farmed it out to Arika, a developer Developer that had made. Hang on, let me just check. Uh, oh, it looks like Street Fighter EX was their first game. Excellent choice, Capcom. Street Fighter EX was popular, but the only universal praise it received was for its graphics, which is baffling because I think we can all agree today that they look far worse than the 2D games. The PlayStation port, Street Fighter EX Plus Alpha, had a title guaranteed to confuse literally everybody about what the hell it was, but it earned 86.44% and tends to feature on lists of the best PlayStation games overall. The sequel, Street Fighter EX2 Plus earned 73.04%, with most critics agreeing that it was a good but unnecessary follow-up. The low point of the series was Street Fighter EX3, which was the first to debut on a console rather than in the arcade. Reviewers complained that it didn't take advantage of the PlayStation 2 in any notable way, awarding it a 64% average. But at least the title made sense this time, eh? Number 16, Mega Man Legends, 76.55%. When it launched on the PlayStation in 1997, Mega Man Legends was received enthusiastically, especially by existing Mega Man fans who were excited to get a proper 3D adventure. Legends lifted some elements from The Legend of Zelda, partly the title, and tossed in some light RPG mechanics to boot, giving gamers what is still one of the best realised and most engaging stories in the overall Mega Man franchise. It received 76% from critics. It was followed by a direct sequel in 2000, which reviewers lavished with praise, celebrating the improvements and hailing it as an exciting indication of things to come. Sadly, there wasn't any more to come. Between those two games, though, we got a prequel, The Misadventures of Tron Bon, starring an anti-heroic sky pirate who carries out various heists and other acts of up-to-no-goodness with her army of Lego men who are absolutely not Lego men if any lawyers ring up, alright? In fact, don't answer the phone at all. It's worth noting that we did almost get a Mega Man Legends 3 for the 3DS. Development was announced in 2010, just in time for Capcom to cancel it in 2011. Oh, wait, Sorry, did I say Capcom? Sorry, sorry about that. According to Capcom UK, it's the fans' fault that we didn't get a third numbered game. And they're right! I mean, did you put in even the slightest bit of effort to make Mega Man Legends 3? <laughs> I thought not. For shame! Number 15. Bionic Commando. 76.61%. In 1983, Takuro Fujiwara designed Rock and Rope, an arcade game released by Konami, which was the first of what we'd now call grapple games. Fujiwara later left Konami and joined Capcom, where he'd hoped to create a better, more refined, more memorable game using the same ideas. This gave the world Bionic Commando, or to Topu Shikuretu O 
If you want to go Japanese, that's fed through an English presenter about this, sorry. It's probably the best known game in the genre, but it isn't the best. That would be Umihara Kawase, and don't you dare at me. Bionic Commando was the story of Rad Spencer, and you just know he gave himself that nickname. It involved navigating tricky platforms and fighting difficult enemies without the ability to jump, relying instead on a grappling hook built into his mechanical arm. It also involved literally blowing the face off the literal Hitler, unless you were in the West, where we called him Mr. The bad. Got him. The NES version earned 76.4%, and the series peaked in its critical reception with Bionic Commando Rearmed, a faithful reinterpretation of the earliest games. It earned 86% and pleased fans and critics alike, which is why it's perhaps surprising that the lowest rated game in the series is Bionic Commando Rearmed 2, which seemed to answer the question, would people still like this game if it didn't work? The answer was no. Not really, but thank you for asking, and it scored 62.5%. Number 14. Darkstalkers, 76.68%. Two of Capcom's most notable franchises feature cartoonish horror and one-on-one -on -one fighting. Combining the two was a logical step, and it finally happened with Darkstalkers The Night Warriors. Originally released for arcades and eventually ported to the PlayStation, it featured a roster of fighters based on classic monsters such as a zombie, a succubus, a mummy, and a daddy. There was also a woman in a cat suit, which wasn't very monstrous, but for some reason, nobody complained. Darkstalkers found an immediate audience. Its score of 71.6% is the series low, which is good news for fans because it means that things only got better from there. The highest rated game in the series is Vampire Chronicles for Matching Service, which is exactly what I would have called it. It released in Japan on the Dreamcast, though a port did eventually make it westward on the PSP. It earned 79.2%. As with any series of fighting games, fans will have personal favourites, usually depending upon the roster. The over-the-top mixture of horror iconography and anime sensibilities, though, helped Darkseid fighters to stand out even more than most, and fans remained dedicated in their following, even though they haven't gotten a new game in 21 years. They had their bloodthirst at least briefly satiated by 2013's Darkstalkers Resurrection, a remake of the first two games. It doesn't count for this list, but it had an even higher score of 81%. At least we can count on that much. When Capcom does eventually exhume the franchise, they'll do it for a good reason. Number 13. Street Fighter, 77.09%. Capcom owes much of its legacy to Street Fighter. The series, I mean, not Street Fighter the game, because boy oh boy was that a stinker. Two players could fight head to head, but only with palette swapped characters. The game was instead built around gradually punching your way through a series of computer controlled opponents, something that would be present in the sequels, but would never be the main focus. It did have innovative controls though. The cabinet had only two attack buttons, and the force with which you struck them would determine the strength of the attack. Many home ports of the game were similar to the original control style, using two attack buttons and determining strength based on how long you held them down. Considering just how frantic fighting games are, this seems like a downright insane design choice, but it did the job. And that job was allowing people to play an extraordinarily terrible game in the comfort of their own homes. Really, the series didn't become popular and influential until its second game, which improved the experience to an almost miraculous degree, with better balancing, more memorable fighters, and a formula that would define fighting games for decades decades to come. In fact, if you're wondering why I spent so much time discussing the first game, it's because there really isn't much I can add to the discussion of anything that followed. They're legendary, and you already know how much or little you like them. Street Fighter is not Capcom's highest rated franchise, but it may have the most depth, it may be the most famous, and it's almost certainly the most urgently replayable. The series is one of gaming's crown jewels for a very good reason. Just not the first one though. That one is seriously rubbish. Number 12. Magical Quest, 78.53%. Early on, Capcom established itself as one of the most reliable developers of licensed games, with their Disney releases still being heralded as some of the best ever. DuckTales, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and Darkwing Duck are among the best loved games on the NES, but what do they have to do with Magical Quest? Not much, but it wouldn't feel right if we didn't get to talk about them on a Capcom list. Fortunately, we do get to cover the Magical Quest trilogy for the Super Famicom, which shows that the company kept its a magic going right through the 16-bit era. The first game, The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse, is the series highlight, earning a critical average of 87%. It also upsets me greatly that they didn't call it Magical Mousetery Tour. The pun was right there, Capcom. Come on. The second game, which introduced some very welcome co-op play, actually only became a direct sequel in retrospect. It was originally released as The Great Circus Mystery starring Mickey and Minnie, but later re-releases called it Disney's Magical Quest 2. The third game, Disney's Magical
Magical Quest 3 starring Mickey and Donald starred Mickey and Donald. And this game is why I specified the Super Famicom earlier as opposed to the SNES. Magical Quest 3 didn't leave Japan until 2004, nine years after its release when it was ported to the Game Boy Advance. Maybe we'll get a remake of the trilogy one day with hand-drawn animations a la DuckTales Remastered. That would be magical. Number 11. Rival Schools 78.7% Fighting games are an important part of Capcom's DNA, even if the company isn't always interested in keeping them alive. The most notable example of this is Power Stone, which doesn't qualify for this list, but which I will be hanged, drawn, and quartered if I don't mention somewhere. Not far behind is Rival Schools, which had three games reach consoles and is often considered a forgotten gem. Not too often, though, otherwise it wouldn't be forgotten. The first game was released in 1997 for arcades, where it received recognition for its then-incredible visuals, stylish combat, and team-up moves that allowed two players to beat up prone opponents. Ganging up on the weak has never been so much fun. A good PlayStation port on its own would have been welcome, but Capcom included an entire extra disc containing new games, modes, and features. One of them even allowed you to guide a custom character through a year-long life sim. Your decisions and interactions shaped relationships between the characters and unlocked moves for use in fighting. Sorry, did you say something? You don't remember any of this? Oh, right, yeah. Capcom decided not to translate it and left it off the disc in the West. And the second game never left Japan at all. It was called Shiritsu Justice Gakuen... Gakuen... Neketsu Saisun Niki 2, because of course it was. But the third game, Project Justice, did come westward to the Dreamcast. The well-received character creation life sim returned as well in Japan. The rest of the world just got a slip of paper in the box that said, na 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 na, you, you're rubbish. Boo. Number 10. Dead Rising. 78.75%. Keiji Inafune will always be best known for his work on the Mega Man series. What's that? Mighty who? Never heard of it. You probably dreamed it. Anyway, his creation of Dead Rising is something that would be the easy career highlight on just about anyone else's CV. Dead Rising took the basic plot of Dawn of the Dead, and actually, the sentence ends there. Dead Rising took the basic plot of Dawn of the Dead. My god, Capcom's lawyers must be set for life. Still, it's a great game. It centers on a zombie outbreak in the fictional town of Willamette, Colorado. Photojournalist Frank West copters in to cover the story and then spends three days beating seven shades of shambles out of zombies with whatever he can scrounge up. At least, if you're good at the game, that's what happens. In my experience, he spends a panicky few minutes running in circles and then gets eaten alive by the horde. Still fun, though. That first game remains the series highlight, with 85%, and each sequel has slipped a bit from there. It never truly got bad. Dead Rising 4, the most recent and poor received game still scored 73%, but it seems that fans never quite enjoyed the later games as much as they did the first outing. Number 9. Mega Man Zero 79.25% Speaking of Inafune, the man himself intended Mega Man X5 to be the final game in that series, with Mega Man Zero serving as the ultimate conclusion to the plot threads left dangling. Then Capcom made X6 and X7 without his involvement, seemingly for the sole purpose of punishing anyone who had ever enjoyed anything in life. That's unfortunate, because the Mega Man Zero games really did deserve to be the next true chapter in the long-running saga. All four games were released for the Game Boy Advance, and all four of them are varying degrees of great. Controlling Zero requires grace and precision, and his emphasis on close quarters combat with his totally not a lightsaber please don't sue us leads to some of the most intense battles any Mega Man game has ever had. Critically, the series peaked with the first game, which rightly scored 82%. Things really should have gone up from there, as the level design improved substantially for the sequels, with fewer blind jumps and instant kill hazards. Instead, the games decreased just slightly in their reception, with the final entry scoring a still respectable 77%. Regardless of which game you end up liking, the most, though, our writer swears by Zero Three and won't shut up about it, it's impossible to argue that they aren't all of high quality. It even has a clear storyline that unfolds meaningfully across the entire series. That's something Mega Man has never had before, and probably won't ever have again. Number 8. Gargoyle's Quest 79.54% Hey, remember the Red Arima? <laughs> of course you do. He's the reason you still haven't finished the first stage of Ghosts and Goblins. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone. But have you ever wished you could spend more time with him? Well, if so, check out Gargoyle's Quest. The original game was released for the Game Boy and scored 76.5%. That's not bad for a spin-off, especially one so profoundly different from Ghosts and Goblins, and therefore unlikely to appeal to many 
of that series' fans. The controls are a bit stiff, but that's probably by design. I mean, gargoyles are usually made of stone, right? Anyway, you fly around and absorb abilities as you progress. You're basically Kirby if he lived in hell. Its NES sequel, or technically a prequel, scored a nearly identical 75.4%, and indeed, it's a toss-up as to which of the two games is actually better. But the increased size screen and, you know, colours certainly helped things. Then came Demon's Crest for the SNES, which seemed to fulfil all of the promise set by the two previous games. Games. The graphics finally conveyed the gritty darkness that had been intended all along. The soundtrack was moody and memorable, and also the overworld became a Mode 7 showcase that allowed you to fly to your destinations rather than walk everywhere, as though Capcom had just remembered that the character had wings. But that was the last of the games. It scored a well-deserved 86.7%, so the series went out on a high note, but it's more than a little disappointing that we haven't seen it since. Number 7. Ace Attorney 79.68% Ace Attorney was the brainchild of Shu Takumi, who also voiced Phoenix Wright in the original games and composed music for the series. On top of that, he directed Dino Crisis 2 and created the great ghost trick Phantom Detective. Am I the only one who hadn't heard of this guy before this list? Why are we not all talking about Shu Takumi all the time? Anyway, Ace Attorney debuted on the Game Boy Advance, where it took advantage of the handheld's flair for cartoonish graphics and vivid colour palettes. As long as you got one with a backlight, anyway. I mean, prior to that, you might as well have been looking into a bag of dry dog food. Wright himself is not the protagonist of the entire series, but he's certainly the most well-known of them. Even so, the highest rated game, critically speaking, is Gaiakuten Kenji 2, with 86.2%. What? Surely you've heard of Gaiakut and Kenji 2? Okay, probably not, actually, as Capcom thought it wasn't worth releasing outside of Japan. This was the sequel to Ace Attorney Investigations' Miles Edgeworth, which was also quite good and is, mercifully, available in English. The lowest rated game in the series is the somewhat ironically titled The Great Ace Attorney Adventures, but with a 75.6% average, there shouldn't really be any <laughs> objection to seeing it this high on the list. Did I did I get that right? It's literally the only thing I know about Ace Attorney. Number 6. Capcom vs. 80.46% Capcom's clout in the fighting game space has led to a long list of crossovers in which their characters clash with various properties, such as those belonging to Marvel, SNK, and Tatsunoku. The Capcom vs. series is sometimes considered to have started with X-Men Children of the Atom and Marvel superheroes, but we think that crossover is the real heart of this series, so we're starting with X-Men vs. Street Fighter. This game combined many of the characters seen in Children of the Atom, but had them square off against fighters from Street Fighter Alpha 2, probably for a very good narrative reason to which nobody paid any attention. SNK got the crossover treatment next, with characters from the King of Fighters and Art of Fighting getting in on the action. SNK vs Capcom The Match of the Millennium was the best of these games, with 83.8%. SNK vs Capcom SVC Chaos brings up the rear, with 71.2%, which is also the lowest rated of the entire Capcom vs series. Not too shabby, really. Finally, there was Tatsunoku vs Capcom Cross Generation of Heroes, which featured characters from Gaiakuten Ipatsuman, Science Ninja Team Gatchaman, Yataman, and other things I won't even pretend to understand. It earned 81.2% on Metacritic, probably because you don't need to know who any of these people are in order to enjoy kicking their teeth out. Number 5. Devil May Cry 83.56% Devil May Cry? <laughs> More like Dante may kiss me anytime he likes, hey, hey. I'm joking, of course, but the guy is a total babe, and if he did want to kiss me, I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying I would, but I'm definitely not saying I wouldn't. 
uh, right, the games. Uh, Devil May Cry can trace its lineage to its two video game parents. Resident Evil, as it sprung from ideas for the fourth numbered entry in that series, and Onimusha, where a glitch allowed players to juggle enemies. Two very different sources of inspiration, but they came together to create one of Capcom's most beloved franchises and heroes. Call me Dante. The game was a massive success, and it soared to an incredible 94% on Metacritic. Capcom, with a brand new hit on their hands, knew that they had to give the world something memorable as a sequel, and so they released a balloon full of cat urine, sometimes known as Devil May Cry 2. Neither critics nor fans were satisfied. The difficulty was toned down, Dante's attitude was scaled back, and the combat system was less refined. It earned 68% on average, and honestly, it probably should have done just a couple of points worse than that, in our opinion. Since then, however, Capcom has done much better. 2019's Devil May Cry 5 has won accolades across the board, and was re-released in a special edition for the PS5 and Xbox Series X/S. Here's hoping that Capcom keeps that combo going for a good long while. Number 4. Monster Hunter 83.83% if you've never played a Monster Hunter game before, I can summarise your first experience like this. You are a hunter. You see a monster. You hunt the monster because you are a monster hunter. Several hours later, after your remains have worked their way through and out of the monster's digestive tract, you wonder what went wrong. The series is a complicated beast full of complicated beasts. While many games distill the act of hunting down to what would more accurately be called shooting, Monster Hunter Hunter makes you learn all about the creatures. You observe their habits from a distance, you learn where they live, where they forage and where they rest, you track them and understand them, and when you are finally ready to attack them, you need to be damn sure you know what you're doing, lest the next adventurer end up having to scrape what's left of you from the bottom of their shoe. It's not a series for everybody, and the impatient will find almost nothing to enjoy, but those willing to take the time will find an immersive and engaging experience like few others. And if you have like-minded friends who are willing to meet up with you online and slowly beat a Megalosaurus into submission, so much the better. The first game, released for the PlayStation 2, performed the worst, with only 68%. That's probably because neither critics nor gamers of that era knew just what to make of its immense difficulty and complete lack of margin for error. As the series continued though, and people realised that this was was an intentional part of the experience, it reviewed better. But if it weren't for the first game getting judged so harshly, Monster Hunter would have been Capcom's highest rated franchise overall. Oof. Pipped at the post by, firstly, number two, A Tie, on Emusha and Beautiful Joe, 84%. It's a tie this far up the list, and both series are likely to cause fans a lot of grief over the fact that they won't be getting any more games anytime soon. Maybe combining them into one entry here is a mercy. It's best to just rip the plaster off, right? First up is Onimusha, which was intended to scratch a similar itch on the PS2 that Resident Evil scratched on Sony's first console. And it scratched that itch with big honking swords. It kept the fixed camera angles, pre-rendered backgrounds, puzzles, and much of the spookums. It was even referred to as Sengoku Biohazard during development, though it wasn't intended to be an actual spin-off. Also, the far better wordplay would have been Resident Edo. Yeah, you're welcome, Capcom. Critically, the games were all well received, with a remarkably narrow spread of scores. The first game, Warlords, was the peak at 86%, but the most poorly received game, Dawn of Dreams, still held the not poor at all score of 81%. Then there's Cell Shaded Beat 'em Up Beautiful Joe, which launched a too short series of its own. 
Critics loved it, giving it 93% on average, citing its gorgeous presentation and its addictive reaction-based combat. It was followed by a sequel in which the damsel from the first game became an equal partner to the hero in the second. That's a pattern that more series should look into, by the way. It was rated a little less highly than the first game, but was celebrated as proof that Capcom had an exciting new series under its belt. Which of course means we didn't get much more of the series at all. Double Trouble stands as the final proper outing for Old Vige. The series didn't last long, but it was great. In fact, you could say that it all came together beautifully. Oh come on, you knew I was gonna do the joke. You'd have booed even louder if I didn't do the joke. Number 1. Resident Evil 85.03% it's difficult to remember just how fresh Resident Evil felt when it landed on the PlayStation. So many games and its own sequels have built upon the formula that it's easy to forget the fact that, at some point, there wasn't a formula. It borrowed elements of Sweet Home and, more infamously, Alone in the Dark, but it's safe to say that most gamers had never had an experience quite like Resident Evil, and once they did have it, they were hooked. We can point and laugh at the writing and the voice acting, and it's fun to do so, but the tension, the atmosphere, and the sheer oppressive horror of the game was clearly in a class of its own. The game landed with an average of 87.23%, which is a pretty great debut. Capcom could then have tried to repeat its success by giving us yet another game in yet another mansion. But from the first sequel onwards, the developers showed a willingness to experiment that has paid off in spades. And yes, I know you're already typing your except for Resident Evil 6 comment, but even that game scored 70% to be fair. Not at all a bad low point for a series that keeps on reinventing itself. There will always be purists who can't abide anything without fixed cameras and polygons the size of the console itself, and there will always be those who refuse to play anything earlier than Resident Evil 4 when you could actually shoot things without having to worry that your next bullet was hours away. And yet, the series is somehow keeping gamers pleased and coming back for more, no matter what more ends up looking like. Its highest rated game is, rightly so in my opinion, Resident Evil 4 at 96%, which is also the rating I give Leon Fringe. <laughs> you might have predicted that would be the series peak, but less expected is the fact that Code Veronica on the Dreamcast comes in second place with 94%. Resident Evil is also Capcom's best-selling series, making it exactly the blend of popular and commercially successful that more or less assures longevity. That's good news for fans, and even better news for zombies, who won't have to stay in their graves for too long between sequels. Good for them. It can't be easy to get regular work when you're dead. Capcom, you are doing a public service, and you have our thanks. 